Hi. So, as uh, some of you know me, I'm Santiago Zarate, and I want to talk about a little bit of bug hunting with OpenQA. Um, and this one, I call it Heisen bug hunting. Basically, um, I think everybody knows what a Heisen bug is, but for those who don't, it's a bug that disappears when you are looking at it. Those are the fun ones, those are the great ones that you always want to catch. Um, but before, uh, just a little bit of formalities. Uh, well, I'm, I come from Venezuela, I've been around, and uh, I have been working previously with voting systems, so um, my main experience with bugs of this type, uh, they come at scale. So that includes some random ballot that gets stuck in a voting machine just because the humidity is higher than the previous two months. And then you have to redo everything overnight. So these kind of things. Um, I've been in SUSE since 2016. And currently I am the product owner for quality engineering core team. Uh, which is basically uh, one of the teams that is dedicated at doing uh, testing of all the maintenance updates, everything that goes through OpenSUSE, and most of the things that go through the product that we have in development that is not specialized. So that means <clears throat> we don't do SAP, we don't do kernel, um, but we do databases, we do web servers, uh, we do um, Active Directory, things like this. Uh, well, this is more or less what I, uh, my track, and that was during my first week of work where I basically shut down OBS for one or two days, because why not? <laughs> um, now, uh, the bugging can be hard. We all know it. We, we all have been trying to find things here and there. And today I bring a story of three bugs. All this starts a, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. But I'm just kidding. But I will not uh, give the full story. But in reality, <clears throat> there are three bugs that are uh, related uh, one to one another. Uh, as we know, Whenever there is a bug being discovered in any kind of software, uh, usually these things tend to clump together. So I guess you have found rats or roaches in your home, and then you, you start to follow it, and then you discover, like, hey, there is a nest here. So this, the same thing happens in software. So the first time I saw uh, the, the first one that appears on the list uh, was a uh, I think two weeks before I reported it. <clears throat> uh, but it was already being reported by another colleague within my team. So, and those two look different, but they more or less uh, show up in the same test suite. Initially, the, I, I think that the failure rate was something like less than 0.01% or something like this, but it was popping up from time to time good enough so that you can start uh, taking notice. And then the last one is the one that really got us all uh, to work out, uh, to, to work on this particular one, because then we started seeing not only random system crashes, but uh, whenever the MD5 sums will, uh, will not match, one or two uh, jobs later, we will see this, a system crashing. So it was kind of like they are more or less correlated. <clears throat> now, I will be back to this. Uh, but in reality, uh, one of the things talking with Colly Lee uh, that we found out is that the RAID, uh, the RAID driver uh, was being rewritten in the middle of a, re of a major rewrite. And this was this this basically tracked. <laughs> it's like almost one to one. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's talk a, a little bit uh, about OpenQA. If you've been at SUSE for a while, you know this. If you've been with OpenSUSE 
you've heard about it. What? Yes, again. <laughs> Don't trust computers. Uh, so, in reality, this is, again, an automated testing tool. You can think about it as a, a robotic process automation tool, um, which is basically just going to repeat the same thing over and over without changing. So by the definition of somebody that was saying, like, if you do, the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing without uh, unexpecting it to change, without doing anything. You know the uh, idiom. Uh, but the main thing is, uh, with OpenQA, we normally can use VNC, we use SSH, um, and through the work that has been done over, over the years, we can connect to multiple backends, sorry, multiple, uh, multiple devices. So this is S390, uh, this is Power, uh, AR64, and so on and so forth. Uh, we are fortunately not the only ones using it. Uh, and just recently, we managed to start pushing for a QA call across different communities. So people from Fedora, people from Canonical uh, and GNOME sitting together, hey, we are doing the same thing. We are testing the same things. Why don't we collaborate? And this is slowly moving. Right now, one monthly call, that's good enough. I call it success. Um, but in general, uh, we have a lot of test cases. So if uh, at any point that a package in the recent years had an update or somebody introduce, introduced a feature, most likely we have a test case for it. Not things in package hub, those, those are like with a big asterisk on it because, you know, support. Uh, but even so, there are some test cases uh, with things in package hub. <laughs> And as I was saying, we have multiple backends. Uh, including, this includes IPMI and what we call general hardware, which is basically um, a, an ex-colleague, Michal Marek, basically connected OpenQA to a laptop. And now, uh, through an Arduino, he's just powering on and off the computer and using the Intel AMT to manipulate the whole computer. So cool things. Um, that QR code, if you scan it, you can get to the overview of the backend for Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is actually in the Franklin Campus office. We have three, four Raspberry Pis, uh, and those are actively being used to test both OpenSUSE and SLES. Uh, on the same thing, this includes Bluetooth, this includes uh, Wi-Fi, um, and eventually, I want to get a little bit further with these Intel development platforms that you have seen around the big boxes. Now, uh, we have nice, nice things in OpenQA, but it's really verbose. I'm not sure if you can read the text, but the important things are highlighted, so that's good enough. Um, so most of you are kind of used to seeing uh, something that looks like something that looks like this, and then you have a, te a, a collection of tests and all of these nice things. However, the important part here is that while the web UI is useful when you want to review things, uh, from the CLI, you can interact with OpenQA at different levels. And I promise all of this is connected to how we got to the MDADM things. Um, so the previous one was uh, OpenQA clone job. So, hey, this, there is this job. I want to rerun it uh, now with OpenQA clone custom Git ref spec. We are not the best at naming our software. <laughs> Uh, what we do here is basically, hey, here's my, here's my uh, Git branch. This is a job that I want to try. Please run it for me. And then it will report to you like, hey, take a look at this job. And then you go on with your life. All, 
these two things are built on top of the OpenQA CLI, uh, which is kind of the reference, if you want to look at it, on how to interact with OpenQA. It's fairly powerful, but you need to know what to look for and whether what you need is actually supported. Uh, I found out the hard way that uh, if you want to search for uh, a particular job that uh, has certain settings, there is a limit on the amount of settings of 5,000, and this is like one day of work. So if you want to know about something that happened three weeks ago, no, bad luck. So, but anyway, the main point here is uh, I have a job. I want to make sure that this, is, that, that this thing is running because this thing is showing me a bug. Uh, or I found a product bug, I need to figure out what happened. Or, hey, I'm developing a new test and I just don't want to be refreshing, pressing F5, e uh, pressing, pressing uh, F5 every five minutes, every five seconds to see if my job is finally done. You have the OpenQA CLI, you can call the monitor, and then you tell, hey, monitor this job, OpenQA is going to tell you, here's your job, nice JSON yes, nice yes format, life is beautiful. So you can uh, even build code on top of it and you will, uh, you will survive. Now, because that is ugly sometimes, or sometimes you want to be fancy and you want to say, hey, the code that I wrote, the software, the application that I wrote, now is having its own automated test in OpenQA. This is, uh, I want to have a fancy batch, you can have it. So we generate the SVG over the URL. All you have to do is put the same link that you will do with any other CI, and then you get that nice batch. <coughs> Um, and of course, you know that uh, if you want to run something, if you want to test something, you have to write a test. And this is one of the uh, nice things is that the minimum, uh, the minimum calls actually required to, to write an OpenQA test is just that first line that you see there, which is Python code. Uh, then you can pass test flags and then um, once something is failing, you can tell OpenQA, hey, do A, B, C, D, because, I don't know, I want to get a, a I want to attach a debugger, a, I want to attach GDB to the running process, or GDB to something that a core dump and try to do other things. A, now, This slide is in the wrong order. Anyway, there, was, there is another CLI tool, which is the, act, the one that is actually running your code or running your test, which is called ISO2 video. You can call this without all the overhead of OpenQA. So uh, you, you don't need to set your own web UI. You don't need to go through all the pain. You just set the variables file. You pass the assets. You call ISO2 video, and this is going to do all the magic for you. It's just reviewing the test results is going to be a bit more painful, but that's a different story. Um, now, coming back to the tests. Um, as I said, the thing that the, the, the minimum viable thing that you have to uh, that you have to do is write this uh, just that uh, simple file and you call that, uh, you write that, you implement that run method, and uh, that's basically all you need, uh, at least to get started. And the keen eye ha might have noticed that the first one was in Python, this one is in Perl. We kind of support both. More on that in a second. Um, but uh, in, even in this, uh, in this particular test, there are two interesting things that are happening, which are the key of uh, what I think is uh, the power of what you can do with OpenQA. So on line, uh, wait a second. Uh, so on line 12, we are defining, uh, we are writing basically, um, uh, we are basically running echo. So 
anything that happens uh, with script blah, uh, it's going to happen on the cost in, in the context of the system on the test. Anything else is going to happen in the context of uh, um, of ISO two video, so the test run. Um, and in this case, what what we are doing is doing that echo uh, X Delta install, and we are passing it to the serial device. So we are using serial communication to. Uh, um, talk with the, uh, talk with the system under test and interact with it, and in this case, uh, line 15 will basically uh, kill the test unless it sees on the serial console the same string that we just echoed. That means um, we can do things throughout the the test execution, and at some point monitor the serial device for x. Uh, X amount of uh, either text, uh, return code, or in, or just uh, whatever we're uh, expecting from any other program. And then there is this call to a search screen, which is basically, hey, I want you to look at the screen, see see what is there, and tell me if you are finding something. Um, so this one uh, is a simple test. Simple, um, but basically what it's doing is testing uh, OBS Studio via Flatpak, and you will notice that there are these, uh, so almost at the end, there is this post fail hook, and what it, uh, so this is one of the examples, so code is not necessarily the best, but main point here is that once my test fails, let's, let's do all of these steps because I need to get, I don't know, certain amount of information of the system on their test. And in this case, one of the hacks that you can do, for instance, is called wait serial. Say, wait serial, test done, and say, I don't know, I want to wait for two hours. So you will have your test running for two hours in the moment exact where it failed. You can connect to, you can connect to the system on their test, do things to it, do things with it, and get as much information as you can. And of course, it's it's Python. In with so we, what we are doing here is we are running Python inside of Perl, and then we have a wrapper around. So it's it as I say, it's ugly, but it runs and it works. So this is one of the things that, that this is one of those experiments that we wanted to do. It works so. If somebody says, no, I don't want to write things in OpenQI because I don't like Perl, there is Python. And if there is Python, there is likely Ruby and there is likely something else. Um, and if you don't like any of that, you can always write your bash script, call it with a search script run, and be done with it. Um, the important thing is that we can not only write the tests and tell the system how to behave, but we can also manipulate it. We can ask OpenQA, I want you to stop this test, this job, at this particular module. Because I know that every time uh, this job runs, uh, this module fails. I want to understand why. Or I know that the code that I wrote is broken, but I don't know, I need to debug it because I cannot, I do not have uh, enough machines, I do not have the same system configuration where this is, uh, where this is being reported. Um, so that's one part. Uh, we can also tell OpenQA to use pause whenever you see, uh, whenever you can't match the screen. Uh, so if we are expecting, I don't know, LibreOffice to open and it doesn't, OpenQA will stop because the, um, the screen didn't match. It will open something that we call developer, uh, developer session, and then it will allow you to connect through VNC, and then you can take out from there. Uh, and then there, is, there are also other options. But going in the path of manipulation, um, 
QEMU or KVM is basically first class citizen within uh, our code base. And one of the things that we allow test developers to do, or developers in general to do, is to append a, a QEMU string to whatever we're, we're writing. So if, uh, let's say that you want to have replay, uh, um, I think it's replay, the, the feature of, uh, of QEMU, uh, you could do a clone job, pass the, um, uh, set the, vari the vari variable with the right parameters, and you will have those replay files also available for you after the test uh, finishes, crashes, or whatever. Um, you can enable a Samba and so on and so forth. Now, that is in terms of the setup of the system under test. So uh, you can even enable, I don't know, I th I'm thinking of uh, somebody enabling Netcat because, I don't know, they wrote something and they want just to be able to connect via Netcat to that system under test whenever it fails to get everything from it, so port redirection, possibilities are endless. Um, but that's on the system, on, uh, that's the setup of the machine of the system on the test. You can also go down one level and take a look at how is that uh, system that is going to boot uh, being uh, basically set up. So we can pass arbitrary commands uh, in the group command line. So uh, if you don't want certain things, you just remove them or you redefine the whole string uh, and then you can start to pile on, on I don't know, enabling, uh, enabling flags for certain drivers or simply uh, adding them to a blacklist, whatever you want to do. Uh, and we have a couple of, uh, of differences. I am not entirely... Uh, I don't, I, I don't dominate entirely the differences between all of them, but extra boot params is going to work guaranteed because that's, that's the one that I use from time to time when I need to uh, dig a little bit. Um, now, going a step further, we can also manipulate the schedule. So which are the tests that I want to run? Uh, you can say OpenQA, clone this job, and sometimes you will have, I don't know, 20, 30 test modules, and you are really interested in one or two. So you can exclude test modules. If there is something that is problematic, you exclude it, you go, you go on with your life. Um, but on top of that, you can define a whole schedule. Just pass it through, the, um, uh, through your API call, and OpenQA will set it up for you, you get it, uh, and then at the end of your test execution, you will start to see things. You can also skip the post-fail hooks, which I never recommend, because even if it's going to save you time, in the end, you are going to miss the logs. And then it's like, hey, why I don't get logs in my, in my job? Well, you wanted to save time? There are some trade-offs. Uh, earlier, I mentioned a search script run. Uh, this is for seeing things. And this is uh, something we can also see with OpenQA. Can anybody recognize the operating system? No takers? Huh? <laughs> no, it's Windows. Uh, I think we have tests for Windows 10 and Windows 11. Uh, and what we are doing here is from a Windows machine, we are connecting to a Linux machine just to see if XRDP and VNC, VNC everything works uh, all together. This is being set up by OpenQA on its own. We just define this job that is running here. It's a cluster. It works in this way. Uh, and it will do it. Yes. And th that's more or less how it looks like. Um, in this case, uh, what we are doing is we are uh, creating a GNOME HDD uh, and we export it. So that way we save time for the rest 
uh, of the text executions, and then at the end, uh, once the dependencies are unblocked, uh, then OpenQA will just open the cages and uh, let the rest of the, of the job runs. Uh, you can play with the dependencies as well. You can say, hey, if this job fails, but all of the other doesn't, uh, don't consider that the cluster failed altogether. Uh, but normally what we want is we want to make sure that we control the state of the whole uh, cluster. Uh, we used to have cluster, uh, what we call multi-machine across architectures, but right now, at least on OpenSUSE, that is still uh, shaky. Now, I say that I will be back to this uh, debugging, uh, to this debugging part. Uh, but one last slide before uh, I go talking about the black magic. Uh, more or less, this is the process that we have. We basically have uh, we have a OBS repository that eventually gets built into the distribution. So we have this. Uh, if it's something that is in one of the rings or a staging project, then Dim start, starts to uh, chase down all of the developers with a stick, like, hey, why is this not working? And then things are moving. Eventually, when that uh, mini ISO is uh, tested, it goes into the main uh, into the main area, and this is the same process for SLES. So we are testing uh, a lot of changes before they go into the main thing. And once they pass a full build, um, in the case of Tumbleweed, we release we release the ISOs, uh, and then we're done. Right? Uh, unless we find a bug that is really nasty and then uh, we have to rework something. Uh, but this is more or less how the process looks like. Uh, and I want, and also it's very similar to how the maintenance process works. There is a submit, submit request, it gets built, it goes through OpenQA. Um, you might be familiar of uh, your particular submission not being uh, approved or released because it's is stuck in testing and sometimes it's open QA. Um, but uh, that's basically what it happens. And we also block updates that fail on lib. So this binary compatibility. But in general, uh, that's more or less how it works. And that's why one of the things that I had to do uh, is, I think it's line, yes, on line six, you see that uh, I am defining a kernel repo uh, because in this case, uh, when working with Coli, Coli was providing us with a home repo to test. Um, initially, I think he was giving me an RPM, and I was saying like, hey, if you can give me instead uh, a repo, we can try it out with OpenQA, because back then we were seeing a failure rate of around, uh, I think it was 40%. Uh, and then over time it started to decrease. But, you know, if you have a failure rate of 40% and you are every, all the time just cloning the same job, cloning over and over again, uh, there is a time when either your keyboard breaks or your fingers break. <laughs> and again, I'm really lazy. So. We have a parameter. We added a parameter to OpenQA clone job, which is called repeat. Uh, you see it here defined. Uh, and basically, what that allows us is to repeat the same call x amount of times. And in this case, this is how you can end up with 400 jobs uh, being created just in a matter of seconds, which is great because then you have a uh, same amount of jobs that are running, you are increasing your sample size, and then you can start to play around. Uh, there are also scripts that you can run once a job has finished, so if you want, you can write even a, a, a small a program that sends you an email, hey, your jobs are finished, something like that. 
Um, and then there is this very top secret thing that is here defined. Uh, but before I go there, uh, you see that there is this line uh, number four git branch. Uh, previously, I showed um, this OpenQA custom clone git ref spec. And what that thing does is basically it takes a git branch and it clones the job. So I decided not to use that, go down a little bit, uh, a little bit further uh, and define that uh, by my own because then I have more control over what the script is, what the script is going to do in the end. Um, and in this case, because I really don't want to wait until all of the maintenance jobs are finished, until all, all of those very precious kernel live patches are done, I change the priority. So that's the line that you see there. Uh, so basically what I did is I just gave it a little bit of uh, more priority than everything else. Uh, it worked, I was getting my, my results fast enough. Nobody complained, life is good. <laughs> or nobody noticed, I don't know. Um, at least with 4,000 jobs, also over the weekend, nobody said anything, so. Um, but now I had to, so all of this didn't work out of the box. I had to do some changes in the test code. And uh, thanks to Peter, that, uh, Peter Cervinka, who pointed me to, hey, man, we have this, all this code done. <laughs> Don't redo it. Just use this kernel, uh, update kernel. And I think that all the magic is uh, on line 14 and uh, line 23. So basically, I want to force my system to use always serial terminal because I don't care about anything else in this case. And um, that was basically it. I didn't need to do much. And after that, profit. So the thing is, with this, we were able to go through, uh, I don't know, I think it was five iterations until Kali finally found one of the reasons why uh, all of this was failing. And that's like the, the, the comment from, uh, from Boxilla. But the, the important part here is this is one of those uh, uh, situations where we can always rely on machines to do the work for us. Uh, but in our case, and this is something that, I've, that I realize that we need to improve, at least in QA, uh, is that you need to know where which buttons to push to push in order to get the good results out of OpenQA. Uh, and then I think that that's almost it. Uh, but in general, I really believe that the that we are humans and not robots. But when it comes to testing, I always put my money on the robots. They are never gonna fail. <laughs> And with that, thank you. This is where you find uh, the code from OpenQA and then the documentation. And over Slack, you can find us in engineering testing. And that's it. Very, very easy. <laughs> Questions? Doubts? Yeah. I'll, hey, Santiago, I'll maybe start. Uh, uh, just a uh, nitpick, but but you spoke about some QMU feature. I believe you called it replay or something like mm -hmm. that, and I never heard about it. So I got curious. So what it is? So maybe somebody who knows KVM can also correct me. But um, I think that the what you're going to get in uh, after I don't know running the machine. Uh, all you get is a set of instructions that happen during certain amount of time, uh, but I haven't deep dived into into how it works, and it's not implemented yet in OpenQA. Uh, okay, cool. Thank you. Regular expressions, questions, doubts. That way. Sorry, I have a question about 
uh, use Python to write OpenQA code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, may uh, May I know how about the progress? So, and how about uh, it is okay ready or just a prototype? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, because as we know, um, less and less poor is not popular programming language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for, uh, this is my personal uh, idea, but I'm not sure uh, agree or not agree. But uh, Python is popular now. Mm -hmm. So is it possible? Uh, how about the progress and uh, something? So there are a couple of things that don't work well. Uh, is this a... Oh, perfect. So there are a couple of things that don't work well, but uh, so name the translation of name parameters between Python and Perl doesn't really work too, too well. And in this case, uh, from test API import star, what we are doing is we are telling inline, py inline, py inline Python to go to Perl to import all of those symbols uh, so that we can call again inline Python to do inline uh, to do Perl. So <laughs> it's it's not entirely beautiful, but it works. So it has its, its drawbacks. Uh, so far, I think there are only two test uh, test modules uh, developed using Python. I will honestly love to see more to see what are the limitations, uh, because one of the goals that I have. I don't know, 2025, 2026, is to open the possibilities of using something else than Perl and that is not using a, an unmaintained a module a, in CPAN. So, a, but so far it works. We have tests for it. A, even uh, if there is a change upstream in inline Perl, inline Python, uh, we will be, uh, we are sure that our tests, uh, at least at the CI level, will catch, hey, something changed and then try to adapt. Um, but give it a try. Any other question? No? Mm -hmm. um, a team I used to be uh, on uh, is the uh, yes test team mm -hmm. uh, and they're contemplating trying to bring this into their realm so that they can turn over their testing into this kind of environment and some of the issues that are coming up now are in regards to the engineering network segmentation that's about to take place mm -hmm. have you given the list of criteria of system of uh, systems you need to have in order to make this successful to the security team and the, and the, the networking IT team? Uh, that is with uh, the tools team. Uh, uh, so Oliver Kurz and, and uh, all of them, but I'm pretty sure that they are kind of working on it. However, uh, in terms of, uh, if you have problems with you know, connecting between machines, uh, you can always ping me and I will try to figure out. Okay, I'm just suggesting that you, mm -hmm. yeah, the, whoever does that looks into it. I'm working with the VERT team to mm -hmm. make our labs in, in uh, Pleasant Grove, Utah, mm -hmm. uh, where, where it's still considered a non-compliant lab when it comes to certification. But eventually we're going to try to make it compliant. But I know the same issue exists at the Franken campus and in Prague. Yeah. And we're going to have to deal with that because I noticed some of the repos that you're accessing right now are on the wrong side of the segment mm -hmm. that you're going to be dealing with. And they're trying to open some one-way spigots so that like download.susa.de, you're going to be able to utilize without violating the the, the compatibility or the, the certification. So, okay, thanks. Yeah, we have also other problems that there is some code that is downloading random code from other places. Let's not talk about it for now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hear crickets. So, no questions. Everybody wants to go home, I guess. Um, so, once again, thanks all for coming. 
Uh, and yeah, if anything, reach out. <laughs>